everyone. It's time for chapter 25 today. So yesterday I read two chapters. I read chapter 23 and 24 and Jonah and Catherine have convinced mom to allow them to both, well Catherine to tag along to the adoption conference that they're going to go to. All right, chapter 25. The next few weeks seemed to crawl by. Neither Chip nor Jonah got any more mysterious letters. Neither they nor Catherine saw anyone else appear out of nowhere or disappear into thin air. In fact, if it weren't for the butterflies that seemed to be multiplying in Jonah's stomach as October 28th approached, Jonah almost could have believed that his life had gone back to normal. He took another social studies test about Mesopotamia and Babylonian this time. He attended an informational meeting to find out about seventh grade basketball tryouts. He went on a Boy Scout camp out where it rained all weekend and two kids came down with bronchitis and coughed all night long until the scout leader gave in and called their parents at 5 a.m. Catherine and Chip stayed obsessed. I figured out why you and Chip were adopted in different states, Catherine announced one night as Jonah was brushing his teeth. Why, Jonah said, through a mouthful of crest. Think about it, Catherine said. Loitering outside the bathroom, she spoke in a low voice, as if she were afraid that Mom and Dad might hear her from downstairs. There were 36 babies. If Mr. Reardon had dumped you all on one adoption agency or even several adoption agencies all in the same city, there would have been a lot of talk. But you send one baby to Michigan, one or two to Chicago, one or two to Indianapolis, that's not so noticeable. There could be that many abandoned babies in each city at once. Jonah spit into the sink, bending low so she didn't see how the word abandoned stabbed at him. I wasn't abandoned, he reminded himself. I was sent on a plane. But was that better or worse than being abandoned? So, do you think Mr. Reardon knows why we were all being gathered together again, he asked, mostly to distract himself from his own thoughts. Is he doing the gathering? Is JB? Is E? Mr. Reardon had all the kids' new addresses in Liston and Clarksville and Upper Tyson. Was he the one who wanted to force poor Danielle and McCarthy to live on Robin Eggs Lane? I don't know, Catherine asked, fiddling with the strand of her hair. I'm not even sure Mr. Reardon knew about that survivor's list. It was on his desk, Jonah said. Yeah, but JB put it there, Catherine said, not Mr. Reardon. Maybe he was just worried about us seeing the witness list. Jonah jerked his toothbrush, ba toothbrush back and forth across his teeth with unusual force. He spit again. Catherine, it's all a big mystery, okay, he said. Maybe we'll never find out all the answers. Or maybe we should figure out as much as we can now so that all the final pieces will fall into place at the conference, Catherine re retorted. Jonah frowned at Catherine's reflection in the bathroom mirror. The concentration on, in her gaze made her look like Sherlock Holmes about to solve the biggest case. Meanwhile, the toothpaste on his lips made it look like he was foaming at the mouth. Who's the crazy one, Jonah wondered, her or me? For his part, Chip kept finding excuses to ride past 1873 Robin's Egg Lane. The house there stayed closed up and empty. Chip also tried talking to his parents and attending the conference. Embarrassingly, Jonah heard one of, their, one of his attempts because Jonah had just stepped onto the Winston's front porch, ready to ring the doorbell and ask Chip over to play basketball. For the last time, no, a man's voice shouted from inside the house. I've got a golf date that morning and your mother's got a spa appointment. We don't have six hours to waste on some namby-pamby, touchy-feely types who are just going to try to make us feel guilty for not being the perfect parents. Subjects closed. Jonah stabbed the doorbell. You can go with us, he told Chip as soon as he opened the door. I'll make my parents take you. Chip just nodded. October 28th dawned clear and crisp, the perfect autumn day. Jonah woke up earlier than he usually did on Saturday, probably because Catherine was already up and banging around in the bathroom. He heard her turning the water on and off, switching the fan from low to high, jerking her towel off the towel rack in a way that rattled the rack against the tile of the wall. He stumbled out into the hall. Today's the day, Catherine announced brightly as she dodged him to head back to her room, her hair wrapped in a towel. Let's go team, Jonah muttered under his breath because the tone of Catherine's words made them sound like they should be accompanied by cartwheels and splits and arms thrown victoriously up in the air. Ah, oh, geez, he whispered, leaning against the bathroom sink. 
she really is a cheerleader and it seems suddenly that this was true not because she was an airhead or a or a non-jock, but because she could throw herself so wholeheartedly into someone else's cause because she could care so much and try so hard from the sidelines. How could he understand so much about his sister's identity and so little about his own? Three hours later, the whole family, plus Chip, were all loaded into their minivan headed toward Clarksville Valley High School. The, well, the weather's so nice, it looks like they'll be able to do some of the sessions outdoors, Mom said, turning around to Catherine in the middle seat and Jonah and Chip in the far back. Yeah, I'm looking really forward to the hike and outdoor com uh, confidence building exercises, Catherine said. A baffled look spread over Mom's face once again. Catherine, those teen sessions really aren't intended for siblings of adoptees, she said. It's not too late to turn around and drop you off at home. Or a friend's house, so you're not a, what, a distraction for Jonah and Chip? Catherine turned around and raised her eyebrow at Jonah, as if to say, You have to deal with this one? She won't be a distraction, Mom, Chip said. Chip, I want her along. Right, Chip? That's right, Mrs. Skidmore, Chip said. Mom, Mom still looked skepti skeptical, as if she knew something was going on, but she turned around and began reading. That dad the directions for getting to the school. Jonah had never been to Clarksville Valley High School. It was a huge new building back up, backing up to a nature preserve on the very edgy edge of the city. The street leading up to the school was lined with new subdivisions with houses in various states of completion. Dad whistled. These neighborhoods are so new you can almost smell the paint drying, can't you? He said. Nice houses, huh? We're not moving, Jonah shouted up from the back seat. Both his parents stared back at him. Who said anything about moving, Mom asked. Never mind, Jonah muttered. Act normal, he reminded himself. They parked close to the front door of the school and joined a line of parents and kids waiting to register at a table in the lobby. What did you do, adopt triplets? The woman in front of them asked when she glanced back. Catherine glowed gl 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 at the suggest suggestion that she might be the same age as Jonah and Chip. No, Mom said, sounding a little reluctant to explain. This is our son Jonah and his friend Chip, whose parents couldn't come today, and our daughter Catherine, who's not adopted but wanted to be here to support her brother. Well, isn't that nice, the woman said. Mom, can we go sit down while you're registering, Jonah asked, because he didn't want to hear any more of this conversation. He could see people already filing into the auditorium. If they could just scout out some of the other kids, see if any of them were the ones named on the survivors list, then they'd have an advantage when they broke up into groups later. Okay, Mom said. Wait, you should get your name tags first, the woman in front of them said. Here. She passed back a stack of blank name tags and markers. Jonah's hand shook as he carefully wrote his name, Jonah Skidmore. His name had never looked so strange to him before, so alien, as if it didn't really belong to him. What if I really am supposed to have that some other identity, he wondered. The identity of a boy who's missing or from the future. Would I want to know that or not? Hurry up, Catherine muttered beside him, jabbing her elbow into his side. We're going to run out of time. Jonah put the cat back on the marker, peeled the backing off the name tag, and slapped it on his chest. I'm ready, he said, though he didn't really feel ready. The three of them drifted through the crowd, peering at other kids' name tags. Sam Ventry, nope, Allison Myers, nope, Dalton Sullivan. There was a Dalton on the list, but the last name of the address and phone number were cut off, Chip said excitedly. That could be right. Let's see if we can find anyone we're sure about before we try to talk to Dalton, Catherine said. We can get back to him at the end. They headed onto the auditorium. Right inside the door, they saw a group of kids who were laughing and talking together as if they'd known each other for years. They wore ripped jeans and dark sweatshirts and glared when Jonah stepped close, trying to read their name tags. What are you looking at? One of the guys jeered. Oh, Catherine giggled flirtatiously. Sorry, we're just looking for some kids we met online in an adoption chat room. We know their names, but not what they look like. And she glanced around, lowered, lowered her voice conspiratorially. And her parents don't know we visit those chat rooms. Only dorks visit those chat rooms, one of the girls said, looping her arms around the jeering guy's elbow. Um, Jonah said, okay, thanks anyway. We'll leave you alone now. He pulled Catherine away. What are you doing, he asked, trying to get us beat up? 
Oh, please, Catherine said. We have to have some cover story. That girl thought you were hitting on her boyfriend. So what? Catherine put her hands on her hips and stared defiantly at Jonah. Jonah's head swam. Didn't Catherine understand anything? What if he hadn't been there to protect her? Chip tugged on Catherine's arm in Jonah's sweatshirt. Come on, you two, Chip said. Cut that out. Let's keep looking. But Mom and Dad came through the doorway just then. At the front of the auditorium, a man stepped toward a podium on the stage. Take your seats, please, he said into the microphone. We've got a full slate of activities for the day, and I'm sure you're all eager to get started. Everyone began sitting down, even the group of tough-looking kids in the back. Jonah got a seat right on the aisle so he could peer over sideways at the kids in the next section of seats. The man at the microphone began talking excitedly about what a great turnout they had and what a great program they had planned. How well the County Department of Social Services worked. Jonah tuned him out. There was a Bryce Johnson in the aisle across the seat from, uh, across from him. A Ryan, or was that Brian? Crockett one row up. Jonah wondered if he could write those names down, passing them along to Chip and Catherine, and get them to shake their heads yes or no without Mom and Dad noticing. He felt a little guilty that he'd never studied the survivors list the way they had, that he hadn't made a single phone call to any of the other kids. Jonah turned his head farther so he could see the girl behind Ryan or Brian Crockett. She had long blonde hair covering her name tag, but she chose that exact moment to flip her hair over her shoulder. And her name tag said S-A-R, and she flexed her shoulder, stretching in her seat and revealing the rest of her name, Sarah Pachuni. Sarah Pachuni, yes. Jonah remembered that name. It was one Catherine had told them him when they were in the driveway playing basketball. So there was at least one other kid at that conference who'd received that mysterious letter, whose name was on the survivors list, who might want to hear what Jonah and Catherine and Chip knew and who might have information to share with them too. Jonah turned to Chip beside him. Sarah Pachuni, he whispered in Chip's ear. One row back. Chip's face lit up. On the other side of Chip, Catherine was already standing up. What do you think you're doing? Jonah muttered. Catherine looked at him blankly. They just stared for all the kids to, they just said for all the kids to go back to the lobby to start our activity, she said. Weren't you listening? Oh, Jonah mumbled. Mom leaned over the seats. It sounds like you guys will be eating your lunch out there on, the, on your hike. We'll just meet you back here at three, okay? Sure, Jonah said, and Dad raised his hand from his armrest in a miniature goodbye wave and mouth something that might have been have fun. Jonah whirled around, hoping he could catch up with Sarah Pachuni in the aisle, but her blonde head was already disappearing through the back door of the lobby. Jonah joined the stream of kids flowing toward the lobby. Chip and Catherine were right behind him. The three of them rushed through the doors together. Where is she? Chip asked as the crowd came to a stop near the table where everyone had signed in. Jonah could see a woman quietly closing the door to the auditorium behind them, probably to keep the noisy cluster of kids from interrupting the adults program. I don't know, Jonah said, trying to stand on his tiptoes to get a better look. There was a blonde head right up front near the table. No, wait, that was Sarah over toward the side? How many kids do you think are here all together, Chip said. Fifty, Jonah guessed, maybe sixty. Angela said there were thirty-six babies on the plane. Chip whispered. We only had 18 names to start with. 19 if you count Dalton without a last name. Did Chip think they should start interviewing all the kids around them? Jonah could just imagine. Gotten any strange mail lately? Ever seen anyone disappear? You know anything about time travel? He didn't think that that would go over very well with the tough looking crowd they'd had already annoyed. Those kids were standing in a clump off to the side now that he was behind them. Jonah could see that their sweatshirts all had skulls on the back. Nice. All right, a short, enthusiastic man with wiry hair called as he dashed halfway up a stairway behind the registration table. He spun around to face the crowd. Can everyone see me and hear me now? Mumbles, yeah, sure, someone. Jonah thought it was a, someone, someone, Jonah thought it was a kid in the skull group muttered, why would we want to? Great, the man enthused, ignoring or not hearing the surlier comments. I'm Grant. Hodge, a caseworker at the County Department of Children's Services. There are so many of you, which is absolutely wonderful. I'm not complaining at all, but we've decided to break you up into two groups for our activities today. One group will come with me and the other group will go with Carol. 
over there by the door. He pointed and waved, everyone waved at Carol, and a woman with short dark hair lifted her arm and waved vigorously. One of us has to go get, uh, has got to get in the same group as Sarah Pachuni, Chip said in Jonah's ear. I know, Jonah said grimly. Mr. Hodge was pulling a list out of, out of a folder. When I call your name, come and stand by the table if you're with me, or go by the door if you're with Carol. Got it, Mr. Hodge was saying. I'll call my group first. Listen to all the names, Catherine hissed at Jonah and Chip. We've got to pay attention very close. Jonah missed the hearing, hearing the first name because of Catherine. Shh, he glared at her. Jason Ardul, Mr. Hodge said. Andrea Crawwell. Catherine grabbed Jonah's arm and squeezed hard as a girl with light brown hair quietly slipped around the table at the front. Jonah and Chip both nodded and mouthed the words, I know, at Catherine. Andrea Craw Crawwell was a name they all recognized. Jonah stared at the girl to make sure he'd recognize her later on, too. She had her hair pulled back in two braids. The style seemed to suit her, though Catherine would probably say it was very fashionable. Andrea was gazing down at her shoes as she was too shy to look out to the rest of the crowd. Maria Cutler, Mr. Hodge continued. Gavin Danes, another squeeze from Catherine. This one a surprise. Jonah hadn't remembered any Gavin. Jonah got eight more squeezes before Mr. Hodge reached the middle of the alphabet. Catherine looked so excited that she might burst like a Miss America contestant waiting to hear her own name called. Daniela McCarthy, Mr. Hard, Mr. Hodge said. Another squeeze, practically breaking Jonah's wrist this time. Jonah went, squeezed Catherine's arm back even harder and glanced around because Danielle McCarthy was someone he really wanted to see. But no one was sho showing her way forward in the crowd. Or shoving her way forward in the crowd. No one was stepping aside to make way for the girl who'd been so upset about moving. Daniela McCarthy, Mr. Hodge called again. The name hung in the air while everyone looked around. Jonah saw Catherine bite her lip, grimacing. Then suddenly, decisively, she pulled the name tag off her shirt and crumpled it in her hand. The minute it was out of sight, she called out, Oops, sorry, I'm Daniela. She gave a sheepish wave. My bad, I wasn't listening. Catherine... Jonah started to call after her to yell, you can't do that, but she stamped, she stomped on his foot and she shoved her way through. The Catherine turned into a owl and then she was too far away for him to say anything. So she slipped around the table and sidled up with uh, Andrea Crawwell and Michael Costa. What'd she do that for? Jonah said to Chip. Beats me, Chip muttered back. If we're all in the same group because of this and we don't get to talk to all the kids, she's in big trouble, Jonah fumed. Sure enough, when Mr. Hodge got down to the end of the alphabet, he finished up with Jonah Skidmore and Chip Winston, and you're in my group too. All the rest will go with Carol. Jonah stomped up to the front of the group while everyone else around him except Chip was pushing back towards Carol. He slid up behind Catherine and hissed in her ear. You go tell them you're in the wrong group right now so you can talk to the survivors in Carol's group or so help me, I'll... And he was too mad to think of an adequate threat. Catherine turned to him with troubled eyes. Weren't you listening? She whispered back. There isn't anyone from the survivors list in the other group. Jonah blinked. His fury melted into disbelief. What? Mr. Hodge called out every single one of the 19 names we know, even Dalton Sullivan, who has, who has to be the Dalton on our list. She whispered, Jonah, we were being sorted. The way she said sorted brought out goosebumps on Jonah's arms. He forced himself to stay calm, to think back, his brain processing information he'd been too angry to fully take in before. Mr. Hodge had called out Sarah Pacini's name. The blonde girl was standing over by Anthony Solvers, a chubby boy with pimples. Haley Rivers was behind the table, too, and Josh Hart and Denton Price. And, but there are other kids in this group, too, he whispered urgently to Catherine. It's not just kids from the list. Somehow, that detail seemed very important, something to hold on to. Jonah didn't feel like his brain was working very well at the moment, but he knew he wanted other kids around non-survivors, ordinary kids who had nothing to do with a strange plane or ghost stories or mysterious letters. It was like he believed those kids could protect him. Jonah, we never saw the complete list, Catherine reminded him. Angela said there were 36 babies on the plane. I think Mr. Hodge called out 36 names. Jonah stared at his sister in astonishment. He didn't want his brain working properly now. He didn't want it to reach the conclusion it was racing toward. He wanted to stay numb and ignorant and safe. Most of all, he wanted to stay safe. 
Catherine spoke the words for him, shattering his hopes for ignorance. I don't know, I can't be sure, but I think, she began, her eyes were huge with worry now, I think, except for Daniela McCarthy, they have all the babies from the plane back together again, right here, right now, they have you. Ooh, just like those letters had warned, right? They're coming back for you. All right. Plus Catherine, which she's pretending to be Daniela McCarthy. All right. So, chapter 26 tomorrow. Wow. We are we're getting really close to the end. Um, let's see how many chapters there actually are. There are 33 chapters, and we're on 26. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye.